All right, we're live. A minute early. I always try to be early to things. Today I'm a minute early, I guess. So, good evening. Retro Tech Chris here. Hopefully my technology behaves. My cameras have been freezing so far right now. They're all working. Hopefully our luck holds out. We will see. Just heard my Optiplex SX270 power on and do its uh, start its backups for the evening. Spoiler alert, it's working again. <laughs> More on that in an upcoming video, but for now, uh, that's what it is. So we'll hang out here a minute, uh, let folks start to join up. And uh, we'll go from there. So, all right, I start to see some folks joining up. All right, so tonight's goal is simple. It'll probably be pretty quick. Uh, it involves this LTE 5300, of which I have many. This one I purchased for really cheap. So as my luck holds out, that means I had to do something to make it expensive. You can't just go for cheap. You always have to do something to make things expensive. So anyway, what we're going to do is replace the screen on it. And you can see that there's a line across the screen right here. And if I move it around, they tend to get better or worse or what have you. And yeah, I think you just saw one go through the middle there. Yeah. So anyway, or maybe that's just the reflection from the lights. But anyway, what we want to do is go ahead and replace that. And this one I'll probably keep as a spare because it's not in terrible shape. Uh, but that's going to be the goal, and maybe I'll start transferring some files. We'll see how it goes. Anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and put this down, get it off the desk, because as you can see, I've got a limited working area. Maybe one of these days we'll expand that. I don't know. And here we have the box. Now, the first thing I want you to know about this, notice about this box is it appears to me that the sender did not spare any lack of using packing tape. <laughs> this thing is wrapped. I mean, what is that, half a roll? So we'll have to see if we can get it open. Uh, so I brought my knife along. We'll have to see if uh, I end up cutting myself doing this. Uh, but if it happens, it happens. But uh, always practice knife safety, folks. It's critical. But I do have this nice knife ready to go. So all right, I'll quit blabbing. Let's get going. What's in the box, says Geek with Social Skills, and good evening. A lovely new old stock, hopefully not crushed through shipping, LTE 5300 LCD. Let's see what we get. So I'm going to go ahead and open it here. Remember, always cut away from yourself, not towards yourself like I just did. Anyway, it is what it is. And I see the blade coming across. I got this cheap blade a long time ago and it usually pops out. Probably not very safe, but that's okay. All right, so we've got this lovely brown wrapping paper. All right, I'm just going to go for it. <laughs> what did I say? It doesn't take long for the knife to fall out of the holder. Let's just do this. There we go. Didn't cut myself yet, so that's good. Yeah, no cuts. All right. Woo. Actually, I should be careful. This is a box that says compact on it. I don't want to damage it. Yeah, if I kept every box for everything I bought, that would be a problem. Actually, recently did a purge of lots of things, including boxes, because it was getting a little bit out of hand. So we had to do something. How anticlimactic. I opened it upside down. But how was I to know? All right, so we see the bottom of the box. Very nice. Yeah, I do need a real box cutter. You are correct. Wow. Look at this. Look at this. Compact. Wow. Part number something or other. All sorts of worn out. 224145001. That sounds about right. So it probably is what it says. It says what it is. This smells absolutely terrible, awful, terrible stench. So we'll see if we can push past that. I think I can. OK, look at this. So we're actually taped on one side, uh, but not taped on the other. So once again, I'm going to try not to cut myself. Um, so far, so good, right? 
Once again, always cut towards yourself. I mean, away from yourself. I mean, towards yourself. OK. Enough joking around with the bad jokes. That's not why you're here. All right. So we'll pop it open. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Giga Social Skills says it looks like somebody was treadmark on the box. Oh, man. Don't say that. I hope somebody didn't run over it. <laughs> nah, it's, it's some sort of glue or something. But uh, maybe almost like a bubble wrap thing was, it, was top tier, you know, like the bubble mailer sort of a things or whatever. So. so I'll have to tell the story someday. But I actually, maybe I have. I, I used to work at a compact center. So there were times where I got things new in box like you see here. Look at this. Read this first. It's talking about the jumper settings on the processor card. Uh, the process, okay, it's. The processor board contains three sets of jumpers, left to right, one, two, and three, that illustrate below. The must be configured correctly to the different displays available for the Compact LT5000 family of personal computers. See that? They're nice, happy family of personal computers. And if we look at the back here, this is basically an exact printout of what you see in the owner's man or the service guide, and you can actually download that. Let's see if it's wrong like the service guide. Um, oh, wicked. The 5400 is not on the list. So this must have predated that as, a, as far as this spare was concerned. It does say very bottom here, first edition. So that may have something to do with it. But yeah, the 5400 is not listed. Neither is the, OK, there's the 5150. But yeah, the 5400 is not listed on here. So yeah, I guess not needed if you're dealing with the 5300. So there's that. OK, so it talks about working with the display assembly. So as many of these as I have taken apart, I probably should have read this at some point, right? But it says it is something hard for me to read on camera. It's important that the instructions be followed when, uh, when replacement of any parts uh, removal of the display assembly. So nice instructions. You know the first thing we do with instructions. So, All right, that's good. Um, hey, look at this. OK, so this is very confusing because we got two of these, and they both see, say read this first. But it just so happens we got two of them, and they're identical. So all right, once again, bad jokes. Continue. All right. Hey, two of these, too. It's our lucky day. So wouldn't it be nice if uh, we had two displays in here? <laughs> Not happening, but that is what it is. Cool. So um, this right here definitely reminds me of what I've seen in the past. Notice how it says 5300, but we also have included in here a sticker for a 5280 because they use the same part number. So the last thing you do is apply the decal for whatever unit uh, you're after. So that's kind of cool. We're going to set that aside for now. And now for the fun part. Hopefully I'm doing this justice. Feedback is welcome. So first of all, in the bottom of the box, we have exactly what you would expect, bottom of the box. Not a lot of foam padding. I'm trying to remember when these things came shipped, if they came shipped in a box like this or with another box. I'll presume maybe another box, because that's not a lot of padding at all. So anyway, let's toss that away. There it is. Nice packaging. Yep. Looks really, really good. And oh, this is the most exciting part, because this is the side where things get scuffed up. Uh, we always have breakage down here at the bottom right, I want to say. Anyway, no, I think it's over here. So that's where we end up with breakage, typically, when it comes to these things. Looks like the webcam's flipped. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, so let's use another tool of choice here. We're going to use a pair of scissors, and we'll very carefully uh, cut this little tape away. Or I guess I could just pull it. It's old, and it pulled right off, so that's good. OK, great. Aha. See, that's what happens when we don't pay attention. Um, it looks like I got that caught right in there. And if I were to break that, I wouldn't be particularly happy. But truth be told, I've got lots of spares. So this is brand new. But whoever uh, opened this from the factory, unless it was me just now, there's a fingerprint on it. That was probably me. It's like right down here. I don't know if we have enough glare to see it. Probably not. Now I'm blinding you with lights. But OK, enough screwing around. Uh, there's that. All right, let's, let's install it. Let's see what happens. So yes, yes, Geeko Social Skills opening the bag and letting the 1980s and 1990s smell out. Yeah, 
Yeah, I remember these machines and their associated components smelled a lot better back in the day. So things have, uh, have started to decompose, but you also do have some of those smells from, that, from the day as well. OK, so here's our, our victim once again. And to get this apart, it's just three screws here. And then another, let's see here. Oh my goodness, I should know this. Uh, another two screws, and that's it. So pretty much five screws, and then two keyboard screws, and you're out. So it's that simple. Um, I've gotten to a point where I can disassemble these things in my sleep. So I'll try and kind of show what we're doing here as we go about it. But yeah. Um, Yep, I've gotten to that point. I don't know what that says about me, but it is what it is. Um, but lately I've been, uh, <clears throat> there's so many of them here, and we'll see what we do with this one, but let's at least get it fixed first. Ah, nuts. So this screw right here tends to, over time, for whatever reason, there's separation. So what I tend, what I tend to do is put longer screws in, and it just so happens I put a Phillips in, and well, can't get a Phillips out, out out with a flat driver unless the blade of the driver fits in there or something. So we'll go ahead and get this guy out. Come on. All right. So with that, we can flip around here, and we can pop off this little CPU cover. That's the name for it, a CPU cover. So there we go. Got that off. Great. Now from there, we can go ahead and pop off the screws here. So let's do that. These are just basically grounding screws, if you will. And then from there, we will be all set. Let's do two more. I guess you have to undo the cables as well. So, so I've also found that when I go to do this, having one of these tools around, the little grabber tools, is so super helpful. So we're going to go ahead and grab that and pull it out. Cool. All right. So now I'm going to go ahead and unplug things here. So we're going to unplug the uh, power. That's power. And we'll go ahead and unplug the video. That's video. And we'll go ahead and unplug the sound. So let me hold those up a little bit. Kind of hard to see, but that's that. Flip it around. Take the final two screws out. And we'll be most of the way there. We can test. And we'll go from there. And I'm going to start copying some files over, I guess. Since I didn't realize I hadn't set this one up yet. Because I think I was going to relegate this one to a parts machine. But along came a brand new screen. So, ta-da! There it is. Just like that, and it's off. All right. Let's go ahead and pop the new one on. So, as one may expect, it's just a reverse of the disassembly process. So, we're going to put one screw in here in the bottom, which you can't see right now because I got it covered. We'll get that in, and then we'll kind of flip this around. So let me get the two bottom ones in that way. We're anchored, and we're less likely to have a problem. There we go. Get the second one in over here, and then I'll flip it around, I promise. That one's not going in straight at all. What's up? Weird. That's odd. That is so super odd. It's going in at an angle. There it goes. I think it's going to straighten up now. I can't think, I can't say I've ever had that happen. All right, so there we are. We've got enough attached that we can do some testing as far as like screws are concerned. So we'll go ahead and plug in the rest here. Come on. There we are. The video cable is always a pain to plug in, but we will prevail. Come on. There it is. Oh, I got it in right away. See, no, it's easy to put in. It's not hard. OK. Well, I guess it all depends on the time of day, season, climate, degrees, temperature. All right. So now one of two things are going to happen. This is going to power up and, and, and look beautiful, or it's going to blow up. I don't know. Let's see what happens. So let's uh, kind of turn things around here a little bit, and we can all look together. So I think I got everything hooked in. So let's power her up and see what she looks like. Maybe I shouldn't have my face so close to it. Ah, it'll be fine. <laughs> I'm not afraid. <laughs> All right. Whoa. Ooh. Well, I would say that looks nice and sharp. 
Okay. There we go. Oh, man, that camera doesn't do it justice. How about this camera? Hey, there we go. Looking good. Nice and sharp. No lines. No fuss. No muss. Wow. Brightness and contrast works, or I guess it's just brightness. Active matrix, right? There you go. Now I'm going to put it back together. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, nothing exploded. We lucked out. So just two more screws to go in, and then maybe I'll just start loading some software on. Actually, what am I doing? Uh, we need to put these connect. What did I say? I take these apart all the time. Yeah. Need to connect these ground wires back up. So let's do that. And then we will be all set. Yes, do not copy that floppy, which I kind of am doing. I'm actually swapping one disk between two machines so that we can run Laplink or Fastlinks and see how that goes. But uh, yeah, that'll be kind of the plan. But I'll at least get that process started. All right, this one here, I always end up dropping the screws on the ground or otherwise. So come on. Get... Wow, this. Uh, Cable is so stiff, it's just not like pushing over. Interesting. Once again, i it's been a very long time since I've looked at one of these that was new. So, all right. We did repair quite a bit of LT5000s back in the day, and yet I still buy them, but that's okay. If I'm like other retro hobbyists, a lot of folks just like to kind of fix things, get them working, and put them on the shelf. And I think that's why I have 13 of these, because I get them fixed working, sitting on the shelf, and I'm like, OK. Santiago, hello there. Good evening. Welcome. We're catching the tail end here as we, uh, at least of the repair, as we put everything back together. Am I the only one who loses all my parts every time I work on something? You saw me looking for the screwdriver, looking for the CPU cover. I mean, I set it down like two minutes ago. I should know where it is, right? I think I even did that when I was younger. So maybe it's just, it is what it is. All right. When we pop these things in, the secret is a couple fold. You have to kind of jam it just a little bit right here. And from there, we can see if it lines up nicely. Yeah, that seemed pretty good. All right, so three more screws. Once we'll put this wonky one in over here for the Phillips. Oh, <laughs> playing games and didn't hear the notification. No worries, my friend. Thought I would do this as a live stream since I did so many compact LT videos. Uh, in other cases, uh, that I didn't want to become have to rename the channel the LT guy, so we're doing uh, doing it this way today. All right, let's get this in here. But I've also worked on two other videos this week, which will be released here in the coming weeks. Have to get a little ahead. I kind of like this once a week release cadence. And uh, well, I'm taking a lot of trips this summer. So need to need to have things ahead in the queue. Not that they have to be every week, but it's OK. All right. So now, now we have a really important decision to make. And it involves this. And <laughs> I don't know what the answer is. Because each machine, OK, not each machine's different, but I have different machines that are configured differently. So let's, let's, get a, let's take a poll here of, of, the, of the seven folks viewing. Do we put it this way, like this, so that it's facing outward? So that's option one, because, yeah. Or do we put it this way, where when the lid's closed, it faces the user? So in this case, now it's facing me. So we'll take a poll here. Uh, option one or option two, how should we put the sticker on? So meanwhile, while we do that, I'm going to do one other thing. One other little minor repair because I'm OCD and it's driving me crazy. This little hard drive cover is missing a little latch here. So I'm going to take it off. And put this other one on since you know I've got 10,000 of these. So, okay, it looks like option one has won. All right, so now I gotta remember what option one was. <laughs> I guess if we do it that way, when the screen's popped up, it'll show correctly, right? I guess that's kind of the advantage. So we'll, we'll verify that assumption here. Uh, yep, okay. 
Right, right. Because we do it this way, right, you guys are right. Because then when you pop it up, it points outwards. So, all right. So we will go with option one. We're going to peel off this 20-year-old glue. It looks to be some sort of, I can't tell. Oh, it's scotch adhesive. Look, we can see in the very corner there that it's scotch. So this is scotch adhesive. So, oh, wow. <gasps> okay, I'm leaving this on. Uh, on the top here is like a plastic pool pool thing, I think. I think, yeah, I'm leaving that on as I scratch it. Genius. All right, so anyway, I will, <laughs> I will leave that alone. All right, let's go. So I'm going to take this, and we're just going to jam. Ooh. Well, you know, 20-year-old adhesive. Oh, come on. Man, all that suspense, all the pulling, and then I can't get this off of here? That's embarrassing. Here we go. All right. Now, fortunately, this is designed in such a way that hopefully I can't screw it up because uh, it just kind of fits in there. So let's kind of line it up. Aw. It's much, you know, I kind of screwed it up. Oh, well. And it doesn't look bad. There it is. All right. So I think now I'm going to go ahead and transfer some files. So feel free to stick around for that. And what I'll do here is hook up the VGA output. And we can chat about computers or life or anything else you want to chat about. <laughs> you got me there. Geek with social skills, wrong way. Yeah, I know, right? Well, I guess if I went, if I put this the wrong way, we, we could make a decision and decide it's a 5280 instead. And I, I have a processor card from a 5280. One of these days, I'll show my um, boxes of parts. <laughs> I have just a few. So hopefully this doesn't screw everything up, but I'm going to switch this over so that we can have the VGA to USB output as well. And we'll have this boot up, and then you guys can, can kind of follow along. Let me get the floppy disk. Come on, switch modes. Once it gets past the post screen here, it should switch over. Hopefully, there we go. Yep, and now we're booting from a floppy disk. Actually, I need to check one thing. Before we do that, I need to see um, if I've got this set up to boot to my DOS partition. So I'm going to pop the disk out. And I use boot at bare metal. One of these days, I think I'll do a video on that. I love boot at bare metal. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that as well. All right. So see that starting up? Oh, it's a little bit off. That's OK. This thing tends to be a couple of pixels off. All right. So we, oh, I don't have any partitions on here at all. All right. So that's the first thing we get to do is make some partitions. So I'm going to come into here to partition work and create an MS-DOS partition. And then from there, we can actually, yep, yeah, OK. So we've got a boot at partition on there, but I don't have an MS-DOS. So I'm going to come in here and make like a, uh, we'll make like a 500 megabyte partition and just call it DOS. It needs to be FAT16, naturally, because it's DOS. And from there, I wonder if I can do both of these at the same time. Oh, good. Now I can actually see what I'm doing. So we'll do 500 megabytes, and that's fine. Love this program. One of my favorite parts about boot at bare metal is you can actually resize the partitions after you set everything up. Hello, Matt the Retro Geek. Welcome. Santiago says, I've never checked, but are there some crazy overclock or mods that you can do to these machines? Um, there's only one thing you can really do to quote unquote overclock it, since the processor cards are kind of distinct. And that is you have to get a faster processor card. <laughs> So they went all the way from 75 to 150 megahertz. If you get a, um, if you get 150 megahertz from a uh, from a LTE 5400, I'm pretty sure you can put that in any member of the series because I've put there's basically three different motherboards that go with these. You've got one for the 5380, then you've got one for like the 5000, the 5200, and the 5100, and then all of the rest of them use a different motherboard. And I have taken a um, 150, meg 150 megahertz processor and put it, or I put 120 megahertz processor into a um, uh, 50, 5,000, that's right, and it worked. So I think that you can basically swap them out. As long as you set the jumpers right, you should be good to go. Hello, Tony Jones. Good evening. Glad you're able to join. So we'll go ahead and set a DOS partition here. Just call it, I'm going to call it DOS and Win 3.11, if we can still see that. And then from there, oh, got a. Enter a name, right, right, jumping the gun. 
So we've got to choose something to boot, so we'll go ahead and do that. Oh, an icon. Of course you have to choose an icon. Let's find a nice iconic DOS icon. There we go. I've been using this program for like more than 10 years, at least some variant of it. Before bare metal, it was called NG, and now it's bare metal. So, All right, good. So now we're ready to boot. Let's do it. You can hear that nice floppy disk <laughs> spinning, perhaps. Um, yeah, this disk is pretty worn out. It gets used for pretty much everything. <laughs> Any machine I work on, I use this DOS disk. So uh, hopefully it still works. Otherwise, we're going to have to make one. There it goes. DOS is always slow to boot. So um, what we'll go ahead and do is uh, load sys onto drive C. So here we go. And then we'll have a bootable uh, drive C, and we won't have to boot from disk again. <laughs> cool. So we'll get that all set up and get going, and I'll start some file transfer, and uh, we'll go from there, basically. That tends to take a while, so we'll see. Oh, I'm going to change the drive C, and then I'm just going to, that way we've got the current directory set to what it needs to be, and I'm going to load Fastlinks. Fastlinks is like Laplink. I think I did a video on this. I compared Fastlink. Lap link and inner server for, for DOS. So, oh, so the way that fast links works is you connect two machines together. So over on the floor here is another 5300. <laughs> yeah, I tend to have duplicates, so that's what we're going to use as our source. And there we go. So we've got basically everything here. Now, this is really old school, so I have to go into options and say copy subdirectories. Otherwise, it's not going to copy the subdirectories. But I guess back in the day, space was a consideration. Don't prompt before overwriting files. We'll go to save it, and it'll beep at us and say it can't save the configuration. And, but it says program execution should continue normally. So the severity is not as bad as you think. It's not completely severe. Hello, Mitchell. Welcome. All right, so I'm just going to basically go down the line here and transfer pretty much everything. Yeah, and we won't transfer system files. I uh, don't need to do that, but we will transfer everything else and do F3. And now we'll start receiving data, and it just kind of runs its course. Um, yeah, one of these days I'm going to make a video on um, different DOS transfer modes that I've come across. Um, including you can do zip drives, you can do network, you can do lap link, which I'm a big fan of. I actually use lap link a lot. You can use floppy disks. Um, but yeah, there's lots of different ways to do it. And then when it comes to network transfer, you've got lots of options as well. You can use MS-DOS LAN Manager. You can use NFS. I've got a video coming out on that in two or three weeks. You can use uh, Lantastic. I've actually done a Lantastic video in the past as well. Um, so yeah, I've got lots of different options that you can use. So yeah. Kind of cool, right? Lots of different options for copying data over. Um, pick your choice. Or I guess you could get fancy and use an SD card and pop it into a modern machine. And from there, go ahead and uh, set it up. I've, you actually can mount an SD card directly in VirtualBox. I haven't covered that because a, a lot of other people have. And there's probably no need. It would be repetitious. But try to, I try to cover things that are a little unique. Um, not always, but that's what we try to do. So. So Geek with Social Skills says, earlier today with DOS, I had to use Deltree, and I hadn't used it on probably 20 years. <laughs> Me too. Um, I was setting up. I'll grab it. This is, this is actually the video I'm working on right now. And I think some of you might have seen my um, Twitter post. This is a Wise VXO thin client. And the nice thing about these is they're cheap. You can get one for like $20. And I set up Windows 98 on it. So, but the first time I set it up, I wasn't paying attention. Um, I wanted to get a good video capture. And <laughs> so I exited Windows. And anybody recall what happens when you try to install Windows once, try to install Windows again? You end up with a Windows.000 directory. And I'm like, oh, gosh. So, OK, that's fine. And most well-behaved programs would be like, that's cool. When I go to install and update stuff, I will just put it in Windows.000. But it doesn't make for good video. And also, um, when I went to install my audio card drivers, they had a fit. <laughs> it aborted. I'm like, 
this didn't happen the first time I went through and created the procedure. What the hell is going on? So um, I'm like, oh, it's got to be that zero, zero, zero. So yep, I did exit the DOS, copied Dell tree out of the Windows directory. I've made that mistake before. <laughs> Dell tree Windows. Oh, there goes Dell tree. And then I just basically blew everything away but uh, the, the installers that I'd copied over. Since it's a thin client, you don't have any sort of, um, you know, any other ways to really get storage on here. So, I mean, I would have had to copy it off the network again or put it on a thumb drive. And spoiler alert, um, this machine does not do very well with uh, thumb drives. It's very particular. So, like, I've done the T5700 HP, the T5300. Those work great. This one's really flaky. It's hit and miss. So you can try it, and you may have success, but there's no guarantee. So I used a CD-ROM drive. Uh, but yeah, this has a really buggy BIOS, unfortunately. But anyway, um, and you'll you'll hear more about it. Also, I bought this new old stock, and I'll probably show this in the video as well. First time I take it apart, what happens? Plastics are all cracky. So this, you know, I mean, th th this is designed for being in like a airport terminal or call center. So they weren't really designed to be used 10, 15 years later, however much later. October 2009. So anyway, yeah. Um, so that that machine um, is going to be a, if you if you don't mind acts of frustration, buy it. If you want something to just work, get a T5300 or a T5700 HP. But yeah, there's definitely different options there. So hello, Ted. How's it going? Good to see you. And Matt says he loves Deltree, still uses it to this day. Yeah, it's great. Um, and I think is if you do Deltree slash Y, it won't even prompt you. It'll just start deleting stuff. So that's always fun. Nice little command line there if you don't want to want to wait. And you're certainly sure that you want to blow away whatever it is there is to blow away. So there's that option as well. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, but yeah, that's been my my foray into using Deltree, getting the little thin client set up. <laughs> so that's been fun. Let's see. So yeah, what else have I been working on? Uh, working on a video. I think a lot of people do this, but um, and they have different methods for it. But when you want to share data with DOS PCs, um, how do you do it? Uh, that's a question. Uh, I use a Raspberry Pi. But in order to use a Raspberry Pi, you have to support um, SMB1. If you're going to, well, if you're to support a DOS machine, you have to use SMB1. So. It's not hard to configure it, but I had to fiddle with it just a little bit until I found the right instructions online. So I thought, okay, I'll showcase that. So there's a video coming out on that as well that's currently in production, just waiting on an intro and an outro. It's actually ready to go otherwise. Um, so that's kind of fun. Yeah, Ted, those aged brittle plastics. Yeah, um, some machines do better than others. Uh, these, they do really well. Um, Toshiba laptops? Uh, they tend to crumble, unfortunately, but, you know, it, it's fine. I, I, in all cases, I don't think anybody expected the machines to be around uh, these many years later, and it's really impressive if you think about it, even going back further, all these Commodore 64s and other machines that seem to run just as well as they did the day they were, came out of the factory, so that's, that's really impressive. Um, some of these retro machines have really stood the test of time. And all the ones that haven't, I think Adrian Black is fixed. So <laughs> he's always fixing them. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's great fun. So it's it's uh, always good times. So but yeah, it's uh, it's good. So yeah, we might have to have a uh, aged brittle plastic thin client face off or something here since I have so many of them. Um, but uh, yeah, we've shown Windows 98 on the 5300, 5, and then on this. Oh yeah, this machine, um, not 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 a good DOS machine, for one reason really, and that is well, two reasons actually. At least one reason. I haven't tested the other. Sound. Uh, so it just so happens the HP machines that I was talking about have a uh, a chip where somebody has written some drivers for, and they work. This one is different, different via chipset than the others, so it doesn't quite work the same. And maybe video. This has an S3, is it chromium or some weird uh, chip? But maybe standard S3 drivers would work for like Windows 311 or DOS, but I haven't tried it. But eh, maybe that'll be an exercise at some point. But I kind of figure if you can't get sound, why why try to try video at that point? So yeah. 
So Marco CS, trying to network an IBM PS2E with DOS 62. I forgot how many options were available with protocols. Oh yeah, yeah, tons. Um, yeah, I think I have a setup video on Lantastic. Um, the key thing that I found with Lantastic and setting it up was that you had to connect into a wired network because of the way that like VirtualBox simulated packets. And it seems to work well for IP packets. It doesn't seem to work quite so well for um, <laughs> uh, Lantastic. So as soon as I figured that out, which was an act in frustration, I got that working. So that's one way to do it. XFS seems to be fine. Uh, Raspberry Pi was hosted wireless. That's just NFS. I think that's pretty much TCP, I believe underlying. Um, SMB, if you use that with TCP IP, that seems to work pretty well. You can also use it with IPX, which is the Novell, Novell? I guess it's Novell protocol. Uh, IPX networks, um, they still befuddle me because <laughs> there's rules about uh, where IPX packets will traverse. So like I'm upstairs right now and down in the basement is the retro PC lab. And if I were to hook up my 4860X4100 up here and try and connect down there using IPX, it didn't work. So there's that. Um, yeah, but something about spanning trees or something, and there's probably some way to configure it better, but out of the box, IPX isn't going to span and get where you need to be. So so Ted says he set up a subnet with a Windows home server for your retro machines. Keep them off my main network. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, that's definitely a good idea. I've got a separate router, predominantly because um, most of my machines are using, oh, where is it? Oh, I put it away. Uh, wireless network cards. Um, it's really exciting to me. Oh, I've got one in this machine. These Cisco Aeronet 350s, which are just insanely great because they work in MS-DOS. And what's cooler than having wireless networking in MS-DOS? And my primary uh, routing that I use in the house is, is Google Wi-Fi, just because I needed a mesh. I moved into this house, and it's like, OK, I'm not getting good coverage. So I went out and bought the mesh network. Um, but <laughs> It does not have support for 802.11b. Surprise, surprise, because nobody's used it in 10 years. So I needed to get another router anyway, just so that I could get 802.11b support, so I could use my little Cisco Aeronet cards, and that works out pretty good. So, yeah. So Mark uh, Mark OCS says IPX only for Duke Nukem. Yeah. Uh, yes, actually, indeed. Um, actually having some folks over tomorrow for Retro Gaming Night, or Retro Gaming Midday. And in that, uh, we're going to hop on and probably play Duke Nukem. It's on the machines in the basement. And I just use IPX for that. And actually, <laughs> the easiest way that I found to configure that was I boot up Windows 95, and just and then I pull it up, and we just do uh, connections that way. And that seems to work pretty well. So one thing I do need to test, because I've also heard that IPX doesn't always do a good job at traversing wireless protocols. So when I go to set up for that tonight or tomorrow, I'll have to give that a shot and see. So, yeah. Yeah, so Ted Branson says he had the license and a bunch of old hard disk drives, so why not? Yeah, if you've got the license to do it, might as well uh, get it all set up. So, Tim, hello, Tim. So the Zenith OE and MS-DOS came with a program for serial transfers as early as the 2X versions. Wow, they were ahead of their time. It is called ZCOM and uses commands similar to those you would use with FTP to transfer files. That's awesome. So yeah, it sounds like they were definitely ahead of their time there if they were, uh, if they were doing that. Uh, that's, that's pretty cool, actually. Uh, IBM came up with a really weird way to do it. And uh, IBM Museum, another channel, uh, I think he showcased it, uh, where basically, or maybe he did, where it's got some sort of a strange data transfer. It's like a floppy disk to a parallel cable or something like that. It was very... Uh, very, very IBM in its thinking. <laughs> how they came up, came up with a solution, uh, but it worked out pretty well, and that was a way that you could get data from your old machine to your brand spanking new IBM PS2 machine. Gotta, gotta leave those XTs and ATs in the dust, you know, and start using the PS2s. Even though the PS2s, a lot of them were 8088 based and 286 based anyway, <laughs> so it's like, wait a minute. But uh, definitely had to get those new PS2s. Got to gotta have your PS2s. So that's, that's how that works. Yeah, it's good. How's the weather where everybody is? Here it's been raining for the past couple of days. Uh, flash flood warnings. Uh, walked outside earlier today, and it was pouring. So uh, good, good weather to be inside doing a live stream. Looking outside, it's pretty bleak. 
helps with my lighting when I record videos. <laughs> I don't have so much sun glare coming in the windows, but uh, it's been uh, been enjoying a nice, uh, nice warmer weather. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I'm a bigger fan of the warmer weather, not so much for the cold weather. Um, I guess that comes from living in Texas for seven or eight years. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, in the next month, I'm actually headed to Texas, I'm going to go to a little meetup there. So that should be fun. Uh, meet up with uh, the obsolete geek. Maybe he's watching tonight. I don't know. Um, meet up with the 8-bit guy and meet up with some others. There's a kind of like a DC or sorry DC. That's where I am. A DFW area group uh, where folks get together and uh, actually uh, Mike Murray. So Mike Murray is the Geek Pub. Recently bought a building and that's where we're going to have the meetup. So it should be fun. Uh, looking forward to doing that and catching up and seeing a bunch of old hardware. Uh, that's always good. And I'm sure I'll do a little bit of videoing as well. So, yeah. So Ted says he's out camping in his garden. Oh, wow. Okay. So you've got nice weather out there where you are. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, the weather turned here a little bit. <laughs> My sprinklers didn't have to work this morning, so that's good, I guess. <laughs> that's all I've got. And unfortunately, my sprinkler system, if, if, if Brandon Bishop's here, he'll appreciate this, uh, hasn't, isn't quite tuned right, so it, it's not quite getting all the coverage, so I'm starting to see where it's not getting coverage, so I guess I'll welcome the rain. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll green up the grass, but once the grass goes green, uh, brown, it doesn't tend to go green again. That's been my experience, <laughs> so. Oh, okay, so Ted, you, you're out there on your ThinkPad T430, nice, yeah. Uh, this live stream is is on a ThinkPad E495, and uh, it's been a good machine for me, uh, though I think that Windows 10 is doing everything it can to uh, destroy it. Um, things like, you know, I upgraded, and now my audio drivers sporadically take 30% of the CPU. I'm like, oh, that's weird. Um, but, um, yeah, some days it, it does okay. Other days, not so much, but it, it's good. Um the machine I really like, where I've been using to do my video editing, is we built this um, gaming PC, and I think it's like a Ryzen 7 or 9 or something or other. It's pretty fast. It's like, I go get on that, I'm like, now that's a machine. Uh, but the laptop's good for portability, and uh, that machine's in the basement, and I don't always want to go down to the basement. I'd rather just sit on the couch and edit. So I, I, uh, I try to do that with the ThinkPad. Uh, granted, CyberLink PowerDirector doesn't always do a good job at being like CPU sensitive. <laughs> it tends to take up a lot of processing power no matter what machine you're on. So maybe I need to look for a better video editing program. But uh, yeah, it's uh, gets the job done, gets the videos out. Um, when I started the channel, I was using Windows Video Editor and no tripod, um, hence my very early videos, <laughs> filming in portrait. <laughs> Pretty much everything you're not supposed to do. And uh, we've gotten a little better. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, I went ahead and invested in some software. What I like about CyberLink, though, actually, is it pretty much takes any format like I can capture from OBS Studio, which is what we use to stream with, and bring it right in, or I can use uh, other capture tools and bring it right in. So, but um, yeah, remote desktop or VNC. Um, oh, into the machine downstairs? I guess I could. Um, VNC tends to, I mean, it compresses things. I, for live video, I have found that VNC is not really ideal. Maybe remote desktop, or maybe I could just get off the couch, you know, and walk the 10 feet downstairs. Um, maybe that's the option. But yeah, every time I go down and use that machine, I'm in love. <laughs> it's just so nice. Um, I, usually my son uses it, so I, I only use it for editing, but uh, sometimes I have to kick him off. He's watching. He'll, he can talk about how much he likes it, so yeah. Ne Ooh, yeah, I like what you're saying there, Ted. Maybe do some sort of network rendering, something like that. Um, yeah, I'd be all for it. Um, I need to make my infrastructure better. Uh, the love-hate relationship, you know, as well as uh, as wireless is concerned, is the transfer speeds certainly aren't as good as wired. I think it'll get there at some point. Um, so it takes a little while for me to copy things back and forth. And um, once again, too lazy to plug into the wired network. Though pretty much every room in this house is wired. Uh, when I had the house built, I said, yeah, I want Cat 6E in every room. And I even got to choose which walls it went on. And I guessed right about 60% of the time. Knowing what I know now, I'd put them in different places. But, you know, nothing like a good plan. Like the one for this room, it's over there. 
And my desk kind of like faces out towards the uh, staircase. So I didn't want to put a desk over there, but he can't exactly put one over here. So, yeah, it works out. Buy a, ri let's see here, uh, buy a Ryzen uh, laptop. Yeah, um, oh, like a really expensive Ryzen laptop? Yeah, I could, I guess. Um, most, most days I'm just web browsing, so yeah, I, I guess I could. Um, now, now my son, he has his friends and they like to game, so that's why we bought that one and made that one really fancy. But as for me, I'm just web browsing and, well, I guess video editing, but that's once a week <laughs> when I'm getting things ready for, for the next video. So Santiago says, how about a token ring network that runs IP or IPX? Could try it. Um, I've got, I honestly don't know the topology of token ring. Otherwise, I could try it. I've got two Zircom token ring pocket adapters. And what those are is basically it plugs into a parallel port and gives you an Ethernet card. And I bought those for a very specific purpose. <laughs> I was looking online at the auction, and I happened to notice that they had the little pigtail steal the power connector so that you could get power for the Zircom devices off of a PS2 port. And I have a couple of machines that are anemic and don't even have expansion, like my Packard Bell Legend Supreme 1125 that I call Taco Supreme. Uh, and Taco Supreme has no internal expansion and no network. So that allowed me to connect the Zircom to Taco Supreme and not have to plug into the wall another cord, which is what I liked. And I have another machine on the way. Once I get to Texas, I'll bring it back with me, finally. <laughs> Thanks to the obsolete geek who's been housing it for me all this time. It's a compact Presario 2200, I think. And it's also a machine with zero expansion. So um, it's a Media GX-based uh, machine as well, Cyrex Media GX. So that's kind of exciting. Uh, so that one will also have a pocket adapter. And I've got one all ready to go for that. So that works out pretty good. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. So, uh, okay, I'll read an order here. So Ted says, I'm just stoked that my Wi-Fi reaches out to my tent. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, that's good. I've got four Google Wi-Fi hockey pucks in the house now. I got a fourth one because I got tired of taking the Tandy 1000 and rolling it out. Uh, as I noted earlier, I guessed right about 60% of the time where I put Ethernet jacks, and I didn't put one in the sewing room or bonus room which is my wife's sewing room that I've taken over a corner, and now I've taken over kind of more like an L. Maybe before long I'll take the whole thing over. I have to be careful. She's listening. But anyway, and so my son's listening, and he's a snitch. So anyway, um, but yeah, so I, I, as opposed to rolling the Tandy out and hooking it into the wired network, I bought a hockey puck so I could hook it and get wireless access uh, and not have to roll the Tandy out, and then I just leave it powered on. Though, I'm impressed. The Tandy will boot up and try to get on the network before that thing comes online. So, got to hand it to the Tandy. It's, uh, you know, uh, got some speed to it. Um, I did put an NEC V20 in it, which I needed in order to make the FX, FS, XFS client work with uh, MS-DOS, which is another uh, file sharing and print sharing application that you will see here in a few weeks running on the Tandy. So, that's exciting. Web browsing on your Tandy 1000 says Geek with Social Skills. Yes. <laughs> You'll see that I use the Tandy 1000 in a lot of videos, um, things like um, IRC, connected to Discord, Facebook. And the reason I do that is I like to show um, how much capability you can get out of a machine that has very little processing power. And we've gotten a lot of utility out of that Tandy. I also have an IBM PC convertible. And I came to realize that one actually has a 4.77 megahertz processor, so it's even slower than the Tandy. It's going to be floppy disk only, though, unless we connect to the network. I recently upgraded it to 640K, so that was promising. But, um, yeah, I think we did a video on that where I connected up a Zircom and I connected up a serial to Wi-Fi modem at the same time and demonstrated a couple of different ways to get online. Uh, but, yeah, it's always good to show, like, capabilities you can get out of these very old machines as opposed to like firing it up on a Pentium or Pentium 2 or Pentium 3. So let's see here. So Santiago says, uh, me neither. I've seen ArcNet, Ethernet, Fiber, but never uh, even Token Ring or E1T1. So my experience with Token Ring, no, actually, I don't think I have a Token Ring experience either. I was going to say Token Ring, but actually it was Baseband. 
So uh, back in high school, I, uh, one of the business ed labs had a lab full of IBM PS2 Model 30s and 25s. And they connected to each other daisy chained using what looked like phone cords. And I guess that was baseband. And they all did remote program load to uh, boot up off of the network, which is why I'm so fond of that concept as well. And did a, uh, went and bought a uh, three com card with an RPL uh, ROM on it and did a video on that not long ago as well. But in all cases, um, yeah, um, the, the, it was kind of cool to turn all those machines on and watch all of these 8088 and 286 based machines try and boot up off of a 16 megahertz, maybe it was 20 or 25. It was a PS2 model 80. If IBM Museum was here, he'd be like, yeah, this is the speed. <laughs> this guy knows his stuff. Uh, but anyway, I, I can't remember. But in any event, all these machines booting up off of that, and you could see them all kind of stair step along. You see them make progress until they finally got to that nice IBM logoed uh, login screen. So that's why I've, I've been nostalgic for iClass and made a couple of videos on that, uh, which, was, which was great too. So actually, and there's, an I, there's an IBM iClass enthusiast group on Facebook. They started following RetroTech Chris the other day. I'm like, oh, look at that. I need to go check that out. That, that's cool that people are keeping it alive. That's, that's fun stuff. So, uh, oh, Media GX, Matt the Retro Geek, Media GX, yes. Um, the Compaq Presario 2200, very interesting machine, very anemic machine, sold 96, 97. My, um, uh, my, my uh, dorm mate next door had one, and, and, and of course, you know how it is being the guy who knows a little bit about IT stuff. Everybody asks you for help, and the college handed out network cards for everybody. So I went over to that little Media GX base 2200, popped the lid on it, and was ready to install a network card, and realized, oh, this thing has zero expansion. Nice. And that's, that was actually the first time I got introduced to these little pocket adapters. <laughs> and now you can do Ethernet over parallel, essentially. But uh, yeah, the uh, Media GX PCs are interesting. As I understand it, was it Windows 95 or Windows 98? That if you try to install that on a compact Presario, uh, 2200, I hope I'm getting that number right. I think it's a 2200. Anyway, if you try to install it, it will like, it won't work. <laughs> it'll, it'll get screwed up. You almost have to go to another machine and install Windows 9, it's either 95 or 98, I think it was 95, and then like bring the hard drive over. So once I get that machine here, I'm looking forward to uh, giving that a try, which yeah, I guess I should have it here end of July, early August when I come back from the Texas trip. So that's good. So Matt the Retro Geek says that was the worst laptop ever. Yeah, um, it's the age old thing. Um, some of these machines say, yeah, we're, we're Windows 95 compatible, run Windows 95 on us. And you go to do it and you're like, this machine is good for DOS <laughs> or whatnot. Um, I guess I, uh, I might have ruffled a, little fe a couple feathers when I put out my 386SX16 uh, video where I'm like, oh, this thing is so slow but the types of things I was trying to do on it. I always thought if you're a 386 class in the system, you should be able to run Windows 3.1, hands down. But that wasn't the case with that machine. It was just too slow, but it supported it. Uh, similarly, yeah, the, uh, the, the Presarios, um, some of the, so the Packard Bells, which always seemed to be, you'd get the next generation Packard Bell and maybe it would have a 200 megahertz Pentium processor, but a four gigabyte hard drive where everybody else was putting in 20 or you know, four megabytes of memory <laughs> where everybody else was putting in 16. I think my specs are a little bit off for the time period, of course, but you know, maybe 16 versus 64 or something like that for memory. But um, yeah, you always had machines that were a little anemic. And then you had Media GX that was just kind of anemic no matter what, <laughs> unfortunately. But I'm looking forward to seeing what I can do with it and maybe I'll benchmark it and we'll see what different operating systems we can load on it. And uh, that should be a fun machine to have. Then I'm gonna give it away. Um, there was somebody who had a um, Presario 2200 sent, sent to them and they had one as a, as a kid and they're about 10 hours from here. They always wanted one and uh, they got sent one and it got damaged in shipping, like totally annihilated. And the guy was crushed because he's been looking for one for years and years and years and years and years. And I'm like, yeah, uh, I have too many PCs. Um, Truth be told, I kind of bought this by accident. Uh, long story, but I basically said somebody was uh, out thrifting, and I said, you should grab that. And that became, oh, you wanted it. I grabbed it for you. I'm like, okay, that's fine. 
I don't want to, you know, stand you up. So I took it. Uh, but yeah, once I make a couple videos out of that one, that one will probably uh, go to this individual who's always wanted one. And I, I, that makes me excited to be able to, to help help somebody out like that. And then they'll have a nice machine they can do something with. So that'll be fun. Uh, so Geek with Social Skills says, I'm watching your stream on my Tandy 1000 TX. You know, um, prior to you doing a video on that, so I'd known that the TX was in the series. What I really like about the TX is it's 286 based. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, you're watching it on a 286 based system, right? I guess you could if you did the whole pixel of the ASCII art version. There's a way to do that. Um, but what's cool, what I really like about that TX is, so growing up I had an SX, and I love the case. I kind of, I may get, I may get in trouble for saying this, but um, the P, the IBM PC. Um, if you look at the refinement and kind of like the the component level concept there, and you compare it to the Tandy 1000, I kind of feel like the Tandy 1000 streamlined it. I mean, they put it in a plastic case. So it was you know, not as durable or whatnot, but it felt like it was more, I don't know, a little more, a little less industrial, which, I mean, I guess that's kind of the concept. That's what their, their market was. But I really like the SX case. So the TX, uh, the fact that it's in an SX case, I really like, because now you've got 286 power. But as uh, I think you pointed out in the video there, the TX also has 8-bit expansion. <laughs> so it's like, wait a minute. So this is a 286 base system, but I can't put a 16-bit card in it. Say what? So that gets a little bit weird, but it's Tandy. They did all kinds of weird things. Um, I love how they emulated the PC Junior standard, and then PC Junior kind of didn't make it back in the day, naturally. So um, you know, from there, they kind of started calling it Tandy. And you know, you load up Lemmings, for example, it says Tandy 1000 graphics and sound, where it really was PC Junior. <laughs> But th those are certainly nice enhancements, having that 16-color CGA and uh, having that sound. So I presume the t that the 1000 TX probably has something very similar to that. So uh, that's that's very good. Um, but yeah, um, that, that, that's a cool machine. And, and, and Geek with Social Skills, I'm looking forward to seeing more about that uh, 1000 on your channel. So definitely looking forward to that. I've had a couple of opportunities to uh, pick up a 1000 SX lately, and I passed. Uh, even though that was the one I always wanted, because I I have the 1000 HX as you've seen, and I've grown quite fond of it. Uh, I love the compact nature of it, um, that it's not compact, not compact, compact nature of it, and that it doesn't take up as much space. Well, that was a nice redundant thing to say. Anyway, uh, so from that standpoint, it works out well. And then I got on uh, Newegg and bought an eight dollar shelf and uh, propped the monitor on top, and it's good to go. So. A lot of people take their monitors and put them right on top of their HXs, and I did that for a while, but then I'm like, eh, this is a little sketchy, so I ended up doing that. Let's see. Uh, Tim says, if you want to use a token pass between network, forget token ring, and go straight to fiber with the... Yeah. <laughs> now, that would be a project. Uh, connect, <laughs> connect up uh, uh, some retro machines using fiber. Um, I don't know, this could be done. Um, I guess you'd ultimately have to terminate with Ethernet, but... Uh, yeah, that would be fun. Um, I haven't ever worked with Fiber. Um, worked with uh, 10 base 2, where you have the nice B and, B and C connectors that you connect together and have to terminate with T's. And then I guess the baseband, and then the, most of it's just been RJ45. I kind of thought that if, if we're like a lab or a room full of PCs, I really like the concept of 10 base 2 in that you're passing everything through the same cable. Whereas with 45, RJ45, you're having to run a cable from every central point. It's like, wait a minute. It kind of felt like a downgrade, but I get it. I mean, uh, you, know, you definitely get, uh, I, I guess that architecture is better in the end. That's how that works out. So, yeah. Let's see. Okay, so Matt says, I had the Presario 1215 laptop, probably very similar. Yeah, I would imagine probably uh, pretty similar indeed. Ted says they're supporting it and comfortably running it. Very different thing. Yeah. Not the truth. <laughs> yeah, supporting it and comfortably running it uh, definitely can make some difference. And then, Matt, you gave a frowny face. What happened? Was it something I said? I hope not. Anyway, hopefully you're happy now. We want you to be happy. Uh, so Geek with Social Skills says, my Tandy 1000 TX Part 2 video will be up in the next week or two. I'm waiting on one more part to wrap up the video. Cool. 
So folks should definitely, uh, if you're not subscribed, go subscribe to Geek with Social Skills. Uh, see the videos there. Um, I know he's got some other cool videos on the way uh, as well that are that are coming out soon. So there's lots of cool cool things that are uh, that are out there to see. So uh, Geek with Social Skills, a 286 running at 16 bits. So with the built-in Tandy graphics and sound, the built-in drive controller, et cetera, it's fine that the slots are only a bit. Oh, okay, not too huge of an issue. Yeah, that's a good point because what would you really want 16-bit for? Uh, maybe adding um, video, but you're using Tandy video. Um, I may be getting in trouble for saying this as well. I have my opinions, but I know there are folks that have taken their Tandy 1000s and added VGA graphics to it. I'm like, eh, I kind of have, I have other machines for that. <laughs> for the 1000, I kind of like keeping that stock CGA uh, or Tandy, Tandy graphics is a CGA monitor. Sure, VGA is going to be crisper and clearer, uh, but I like having that. So who was it recently who, oh, I know who it was, Mr. Lurch's things. Check his channel out. He recently put together an XT and put an EGA card in it. And what he found was that the performance trying to drive those EGA graphics was not good. So uh, he, he dropped it to CGA mode on the EGA and then it worked out better. So I think that video's out now. So uh, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, 286, 16 bit bus. It's pretty good. I had a variety of 286 systems. Um, one of the first 286 systems I had was kind of an old disc card from my dad's office. It had a monochrome monitor. I want to say it was 10 or 12 megahertz. Uh, eventually progressed and got a 20 megahertz one that somebody put together for me. This is back before um, I really knew much about assembling and putting things together. And it was kind of funny. One day I was using the machine and I hit a key combination. I noticed the machine all of a sudden sped up like tremendously and what I had hit was control alt plus so what happened is somebody had jumpered the turbo switch to be slow because there was no turbo switch connected so I had had this machine for months and months and months and months and months running at six megahertz and didn't know it jumpered it up to 20 I'm like that's fast I'm like when I got the machine because it was basically a replacement motherboard for another machine that had failed which was like 10 or 12 megahertz. I'm like, why is this machine so much slower? It should be faster. Well, that was why. After that, I'm like, cool beans. So let's see here. So Geek with Social Skills says the Tandy CGA with 16 colors is awesome. I agree. It's really, really nice. Uh, definitely like to run that. And even with all the extra uh, allocations there, you're able to take that Tandy 1000 and run even like Windows 3.0 in a Somewhat decent graphics mode, uh, but yeah, Tandy 1000 graphics are really, really cool. I definitely enjoy them. It's been great. Sort of like EGA, yep. EGA with a little bit worse dot pitch, <laughs> I found. Unless maybe somebody makes a really high-resolution CGA monitor. I don't know if it's the video standard. I guess I could figure this out by using like a, one of those, oh, it escapes me right now, CGA converters just to see if the video quality gets better. But it always seems like every CGA monitor I've always seen, and even for the 1000, I've got a CM11. And that CM11 has a good, uh, good dot pitch for CGA monitor versus say like a CM5 that came with the Tandy 1000 series. Uh, you, can, you can see there's just, it's just not as crisp and clear as say like an EGA or a VGA monitor. So I don't know if that's the video standard or it's the dot pitch or the limitation of how many dots you can have with CGA. But performing the characters so yes so geek with social skills says the cm11 looks great compared to the cm5 um, i really lucked out with when i bought my hx uh, bought it from hagerstown maryland um, sent the guy who was selling it who had basically pulled it out of the trash was not an enthusiast uh, a message he was selling it for 50 dollars a tandy 1000 hx with cm11 which is an odd pairing typically you would think the lower cost um HX would be paired with a 5, but this one happened to have an 11. And he also had a Coco 3 that he gave me as well. He's like, you can have this too. <laughs> $50. Like, I got to pay you a little bit more because, um, yeah. But he basically said that within like a couple of hours of posting it, that he had like 35 people reach out to him and try and buy it. And he selected me because I, I told him in my message that I was a, a collector and an enthusiast. You know, that was nice of him. Really, really nice guy. Sent him some follow-up videos of some things I had done to the machine after I put the XTID in there, or XTCF and other things, and he, he was appreciative, even though he's not, not an enthusiast, but he was thought it was kind of cool to see what you could do with the machine. 
Um, but yeah, the uh, I much prefer the eleven over the five. But if if it's between having a five and nothing at all, I would definitely take the five. Yeah. I hear the um, Optiplex SX70 kicking into high gear with its fans, which always makes me nervous because of the past history of that machine. Uh, but yeah, it seems to be uh, doing its nightly seven o'clock backup. It should be wrapping it up about right now. But yeah, runs every night and does its backup. Um, it sits over, over on the other side of my desk next to my uh, DX4100 and my Gateway 2486 DX266 that I drove quite a distance to get, but had to have. <laughs> so there's that as well. So uh, getting back to the Compaq, we can see that it is copying over Oregon Trail for Windows. And Oregon Trail for Windows is kind of designed to be running on a off of a CD. It's actually the CD version of it. If you have a retro machine, I almost feel like you have to have Oregon Trail, you know. So we've got Oregon Trail in here, and uh, it takes a long time to copy over and takes up a lot of hard disk space. Probably what I'll end up doing is I like to install uh, DOS and 3.1 on these, and then I like to. Uh, uh, install 95. So I, I dual boot them with boot it, as you saw. And I'll probably make a common partition where I'll put Oregon Trail, and that can share between the 95 and the 3.1. Because this machine, I think right now, has a 1.2 gigabyte drive in it. And um, that's that's something I should do this weekend, I, having the retro party, as I noted. But I should power up all 13 of these and see how many failure, failures I get. It's, it's, it's without... Uh, it's without, it, it never happens that they all power on and don't have a failure. <laughs> Something fails. A hard drive dies, a CPU dies, a, a processor board, a DC to DC inverter dies, a motherboard dies. Typically not screens. Screens to do, to do, seem to do pretty well, but something always dies every time you power these things up. So maybe I'll have a power up fest. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but yeah. I was hoping it could finish so that we could boot it up. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of losing my optimism. We'll give it a few more minutes, and then from there we can boot it up into uh, DOS and Windows 3.11, and I could even put the, the wireless card in there and get onto my nice wireless network. That could, that could work out. I'll do that right now. So I'm, I'm running out of them. I, I bought a lot of these. I bought like 10 of them. I bought them in a batch of 10 because... They were cheaper that way, and somebody was just kind of selling them and clearing them out. And I'm like, ah, I'll never have this many LT 5000s to put them in. Yeah. <laughs> but prior to that, I'd actually been buying these Zircon wireless cards that look identical, but they don't work in MS-DOS, so they got traded out for these. I wish I would have discovered these first because they, uh, they, they work really, really, really well. So let's see. What are we up to? Oregon.exe. All right. We're gonna, we'll give it a few more minutes, but uh, yeah. Yeah, fast links is still my favorite way to uh, copy files. Um, sometimes I do put those wireless cards in, um, but they it always chokes, and it's an easy fix. But the way whatever you name your wireless card or your network card in uh, DOS becomes a file handle. <laughs> so in this case, it's like error 350. So when it tries to copy any of the Aeronet drivers over, because I, I do that as well when I do the copying, it always fails because that's a file handle name. Yeah, how about that? So it's just kind of like, okay, it just, it becomes an exercise and annoyance, and I've gotten to the point where I just want to set it and forget it, so that's why I set it up this way. <laughs> just use Laplink to copy it or fast links with my lovely cable that I bought, um, which is basically a null modem cable and a Laplink cable zip tied together. So if you ever want to make a Laplink cable, you can definitely do that. And of course, another cool thing about Laplink is you can indeed, um, using the null modem side of things, you can upload Laplink from one PC to another. So let's suppose you've got a machine you want to load up, but it's got a broken floppy drive or doesn't have another way to get Laplink or Fastlinks on it. Either one, you can remotely upload it using that and kind of it kind of bootstraps itself. Then you can copy more files. That's a cool concept. And back in the day, that had a success rate of. I don't know. Depending upon the machines, I tried it on 60 to 70 percent. Uh, on all the retro machines that I have that I've tried it on, it's worked like 100 percent of the time. So that's been really exciting, um, which is kind of cool. Also cool to try and transfer uh, files via uh, uh, infrared, which is basically just another serial port. 
Procta. Hi, Chris. When are you going to remote do the remote Windows 95 remote boot? Well, about that, yeah. So Procta and I talked about this concept a little bit since I've done some other remote boots, including Pixie, including RPL, or Ripple, or whatever you want to call it. Um, the problem with the 95 remote boot off of an NT4 system, because that's how it would work, is finding a version of 95 that has all the goodies in it that you need to actually install that. And um, I tried six or seven downloads. I couldn't find something that works, so I kind of gave up for now. It's on the list of videos, um, on the list of about 80 videos I want to make, <laughs> uh, plus other ideas that I come up with. Um, but yeah, and when we'll do it at some point, um, just probably not here in the too near term. That might be a good winter video um, as well, uh, summertime um, videos that are a little bit not as um, uh, having to dig so deep to get something to work, though I'm not doing a real good job of that either, either. Um, tend to be things that I can uh, get, get out and get to, the get to the channel and folks can watch, and then I can do some other things, especially if the weather's nice and with travel and vacations and all that, so yeah. As we've got got some plans upcoming here to uh, enjoy this summer, <laughs> so it'll it'll take me away from my retro computers for a little bit. That's okay. Uh, I'm not going to take them on the trips. <laughs> They'll be here when I get back. Probably take my laptop, but not going to not going to take any of the retro machines. So they'll uh, they'll be here, nice and doing their thing. That should be good. Yeah, it's kind of fun. So something I'd actually thought about and engaging other folks to do uh, retro things, maybe at some point it would be fun to do a live stream where we play um, a game like Tetranet or maybe Doom or Duke Nukem over the internet. Everybody on their retro machines or simulated using DOSBox or something like that. Uh, set up little tournaments. Uh, that would be kind of a fun thing to do. So that yeah, might be something to, to look at in the future and see if uh, folks want to do that. I can definitely set something up like that. Um, I know some of the games certainly have a limitation as to the number of people that you can put in at any given time. I, I don't know what Doom and Duke Nukem's limits are. Tetranet, which is basically network Tetris, where you can do things like get special powers or special blocks as you clear them, where you can do things like nuke, some, nuke your own field or, or block splatter somebody else's or add lines to other people's fields. We have a lot of fun playing that whenever we have retro parties. It's, uh, it's always a hit. That'd be fun to do over the internet. Proctor says he will do some more research on the version for me. Thank you. And you will be duly credited for that research. Yeah, if you happen to find an ISO that we can use, I'll, uh, I'll put it into play. I think with, uh, if I can get uh, an ISO of 95 that has that remote boot capability, we can then take and mirror that with uh, NT4. I think that that would actually be the easy part, <laughs> getting that installed. Um, but yeah, uh, we just need to find it. Uh, but yeah, the procedure is kind of beefy, um, and when we go to do that, I'll certainly take it and consolidate it down so that others can try it as well. Uh, kind of the step-by-step -step procedures that I'm that I'm famous for. <laughs> well, okay, don't get carried away. I'm not famous for it, but that I like to do on the channel so that folks can see. So that works out pretty good. So yeah, I look forward to that. Yeah, if you find something, definitely send it my way, um, and I will make use of it because I would like to do that video. I just don't have all of the necessary piece parts to do it. And after opening up about five or six different Windows 95 ISOs and not finding the uh, packages I need or the application I need, I'm like, yeah, we'll have to look at this some other time. And the video went back on the list for a, a rainy day. Like I said, maybe like sometime in the, in the winter, something like that when it's not so, not so nice to vacation. <laughs> not to say you shouldn't vacation in the winter. I always take time off during the winter uh, as well, end of, the, end of the year. I think a lot of people do. A lot of places shut down for a few weeks, which is always nice. That's good. Yeah. So what else is on everybody's mind? What sort of what retro projects are folks working on? And I'll ask this question. Has anybody tried any of my experiments? <laughs> I'm always throwing experiments out there. I'm curious, uh, you know, any, any given video uh, that tend to be more experiment-based, uh, get a couple hundred views. And I'm not, I'm not in it for the view counts. Um, I'm in it for, like, giving back because... Um, for every time that I've picked up Google and searched for something and had an answer, I'm, I'm happy to finally give some answers back and some procedures for different things that people want to try and uh, do some new things like, you know, push messages in MS-DOS, <laughs> things like that. Um, so, yeah, I'd be curious to hear what sort of things people are working on. 
so uh, Brockta says he messed with Windows three, uh, 351 NT domain networking. Cool, awesome. Yeah, that, that's, that's awesome. Uh, I have never loaded up NT351, which is kind of surprising. As much as I love Windows 3.11 and the interface or the shell is the same. So one of these days, I'm gonna have to load that up and have a look at it. I, it kind of, shame on me. I, it's always interesting. Um, in retrospect, you look and you're like, oh, I must have missed a generation of something. As I never installed that version. Why that couldn't have been Windows Vista, I don't know, but I digress. Um, but yeah, there, there's cases where it's like, oh yeah, I missed a generation of some application. And 3.5.1 just kind of flew right past me because the first NT that I ever installed was 4. So I must have kind of like missed that, that sweet spot of, of that, uh, not having a powerful enough machine or just not seeing people running it at the time. So that, that could have been what happened there. So let's see, Geek with Social Skills says, I want to do the remote garage door project you did a while ago. Yes, you should. Um, and I think... The source code is out there. If you have a Chamber, Chamberlain LiftMaster, you should be able to do it. Matt, the retro geek, has uh, repeated that experiment uh, and was able to, uh, to use that on, on his system. So that's good as well. Uh, but yeah, that's a fun one. <laughs> so esoteric, right? Internet of things via IRC chat. But that's kind of the point. It's like I always... I'm, I've always been a fan of like integrating things together. I've always enjoyed that. Um, very early on, back before it became a thing, I worked on a project called Network Caller ID, and I actually still run the app on my phone, where all calls and messages get aggregated to a central location, and they're available to see. So um, if I see a call coming in from another number, I know whether or not to answer it. And I, I did this at one point so that I could see the calls coming in on the computer. So when my sister-in-law knew I called, I knew whether or not I needed to get up off the couch and answer the phone. So that was the concept. Um, she's a nice, she's a nice girl. I'm just anyway. That's 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 the running joke. It seems to work out pretty good. Let's see here. Tony Jones asked the question: Could you make a combat for Serio 2200 on 86 box? I could. I thought you did. Didn't you make one? Um, and does 86 box and PCEM now support that? I guess somebody's, hey, it's finished. Somebody's found the ROMs or whatnot to be able to do that. Um, if so, yeah, um, that would be a fun thing to do. Um, if somebody else has already done it, I'd prefer just to get their image of it. But yeah, I mean, I could, I could do that. I'm going to have a real one here before too long once I uh, pull it back from Texas. So, all right, we've got 49 megabytes of memory, 48 megabytes of memory on this puppy. Let's, uh, let's see it boot up into Windows 311 land, and uh, that'll, that'll be uh, lots of happiness. Uh, I'm using the um, VGA to USB video converter today, and it has a little bit of trouble in switching resolutions, as you can see here. <laughs> uh, video, out, video is upcoming on that as well, actually. We're going to talk about... Oh, did I miss the dialog? Oh, there we go. Where I talk about my two video capture devices and which one I like more. I don't think that video's come out yet. I think that comes out in a couple weeks. Um, so for folks who want to do retro video capture, I've got my VGA to USB and I've got my StarTech uh, capture and uh, each has its own. Let's look at games real quick. So we've got like Wolfenstein on here. Turn up the sound a little bit. Nice little window. So it seems to work out pretty good. This is a Pentium 133. So it does a pretty good job of rendering this. Oh, ah, oops. I. Funny thing, I actually don't play these kind of games. It, it's I have them loaded on the system so that like folks can play them during the retro parties, but I've never gotten into these first-person shooter games. But this is about as far as I play them for like doing performance tests and things. So, uh oh, I ran out of bullets. <laughs> so as you can see, I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. And some people can play this with a mouse. So that's kind of fun too. So, all right, enough of that. All right. So Procta says, for some reason, not many people play with NT351. Drivers can be a little tricky, yeah. I found that in general with uh, NT, it seems like the drivers were always kind of a story, even with uh, 4.0. But yeah, over time, I guess uh, things did work out and got easier. I feel like when we got, got to Windows 2000, then really XP, I kind of feel like XP was the good first blending of a... Uh, NT-based architecture where you could actually install drivers and not pull your hair out. <laughs> so things definitely got better over time, for sure. 
Uh, let's see. So Ted says, me and my big mouth boasting about my Wi-Fi. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> oh, did it cut out on you? Oh, man. Yeah. Um, oh. Oh, you can only share resources that are on your computer. What? I have never seen that before. Uh, weird. OK, maybe I was trying to share something. Oh, right. Um, I probably had shared out a C drive and a D drive at one point on the, on the other 5300, and that's what's making it angry. But yeah, here you can see uh, we're booted up to my standard Windows 3.1.1 install. And depending upon um, the type of machine that I have it on, if it's a 640 by 480, an 800 by 600, or a 1024 by 768, I move things around a little bit. So there we can pop over to drive Z, which is my Raspberry Pi, and there's all the SMB1 file shares that you see. So, so Geek with Social Skills says, have a great evening. I'm almost uh, beer 30 here on the West Coast. Definitely. Hey, thanks for joining. Uh, always great to chat with you. And folks who are not subscribed to his channel should go and check it out for sure. Please do. Um, Ted says, just had a blank screen for the last 20 minutes. <laughs> oh, so you had to just hear me talk. Oh, my. How about that? Uh, yeah. Oh, interesting. So the Raspberry Pi cannot be found. That's weird. I'm not sure what's going on with that. Let me see if I can pop the screen over here. Um, weird. Maybe there's something wonky going on with the networking. Oh, my goodness. 1.30 1 in the morning in Scotland. Ah, the networks and networking's host. Now, when I went to boot up the other 5300, this card was having some issues, so it's possible that there's something wrong here, Fred. Oh, I'll have to diagnose that. I'm assuming I didn't get an IP address. Actually, I did. Maybe the Raspberry Pi's off. Oh, maybe the Raspberry Pi's offline. Let's try FilePi. Yeah. Ooh. Well, that's no good. <laughs> <laughs> what I have found with the Raspberry Pis is if you configure them to have, I should mention this in the, when I make that video, if you configure them to have both wired and wireless networking at the same time, it'll have fits. So am I just misspelling it? Weird. Okay, there we go. I guess it just took a minute to resolve. So now if we do a Dura Z drive, do we have data? Yes. Again. Oh, oh, that's funny. So um, I guess I had this card in another machine, and now it's having a conflict with the um, MAC address because it's been assigned. Once again, things that I have never seen until I do this live stream, which is really hilarious. But that's kind of that's one for the books as well. So Ted said he had no visuals, but I did have an owl hooting in the tree. <laughs> Yeah, we have some uh, common land nearby, and there's an owl that lives somewhere in one of the trees, and we definitely uh, hear that owl uh, at nighttime, so that owl does pop in. Um, also, this time of year, we have fireflies, or as we call them here in the Virginia area, lightning bugs, and they light up the trees really nice. I need to keep an eye out for that. That's quite a spectacle when they come out. And a lot of folks are having cicadas right now, but uh, our house is too new. Uh, I think all the ground got dug up uh, in the past couple years, so uh, they won't have them. Let's see here. So uh, Malivi says, blue screen during demo is so Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually a little surprised that it came up with an Ethernet conflict. Um, this did get assigned address 240, as I recall. But it must just be that that MAC address must have registered. But yeah, I've never seen that before, because it's not installed in that machine. So Google must have held onto the entry. <laughs> but yes, I hear you. For sure. OK, so Tim says the RTM retail upgrade ISO of Windows 95 at WinWorld has the net setup tools. Really? Um, I could have sworn I had a look at that one, and it didn't. So that's good to know. Maybe I pulled the wrong one. Um, yeah, OK, cool. I'll have to catch up with you on that and, and, and try that, because I downloaded Well, <clears throat> I mean, I used copies of several of them, and I couldn't find one that had it. So good. Good to know. Yeah, that's something I definitely want to want to pop in and do another integration activity. And I always love doing integration, as I noted. So that's kind of fun. Good, 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 good. Yeah, we're going to document the heck out of that one because you know, any time that pieces are kind of scattered to the edge of the earth, it's good to have a collective place where folks can go and and pull them in and and uh, 
and grab things. And I tend to save copies of things that I do on my PC as well because there's going to come a day where an XFS client or something isn't going to be available and then, you know, they'll have it available that I can maybe make it available somewhere. So, okay, Proctor says you need to check the admin tools in Windows 95. Yeah, I thought I did. Um, maybe I didn't spend enough time on it. Uh, that might have been during the time where I was suffering COVID and delusional and delirious more so than usual. So that could very well be that I, I missed that, but I'll definitely gonna have to go have a look again if that's the case um, and grab that. Thought I would show you the Flying Toaster is one of my favorite screensavers, and this runs quite well on a, a Pentium 133. Not so well on a 386 SX16. All right, knock it off, Chris. No more talking about the SX16. <laughs> but yeah, you can see that's uh, that in all of its all of its glory there. Um, Flying Toasters, the later versions kind of have a nice anthem song and everything that goes along with it as well. So I had my kids singing it. <laughs> Trying to think what the tune that it's set to is. So we learned two things from there. One, uh, Chris needs singing lessons. And two, uh, whatever theme that is, uh, is some sort of a march song or something. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I need singing lessons. So, but yeah, this is uh, this is set up kind of nice now, uh, other than those weird conflicts. Uh, but yeah, it seems to be happy. We have our Oregon Trail in here because you have to have Oregon Trail, as I noted, um, taking up all the nice hard disk space that it is. This is the Windows version. My favorite version of Oregon Trail is on the Apple II GS, so I guess technically the Apple IIe, the MECC version, because that was the first one that I ever toyed with. Um, Though ironically, I only have one Apple machine in the whole house, and it's my MacBook Pro for work. <laughs> I didn't even choose it. But uh, yeah, uh, as, as folks who watch know, I'm kind of a one-trick pony. It's either uh, uh, it's either MS DOS based, uh, 3.1 based, or 95, 98 based. Though I do have an Athlon XP. Uh, oh, there we go again. That is so weird. I um, do have an Athlon XP system, uh, and I do have a Pentium 3 system and a Pentium 2 system. That looked for a minute like it was going to be fatal. I hadn't seen a blue screen in the past. It was just a blue screen without text, but uh, a couple of presses of the space bar got us out of that. So, <laughs> interesting. So, Proctor says he's going to check the version he has. It may have the NetSet files for remote. We may be able to use the tools off it. Yeah, it works too. Um, I'm not against taking those and like archiving them off somewhere because they're not particularly easy to find. Um, so if we could put them in a collective place, that may not be such a bad thing. Go ahead and pop out of there, um, since I don't have much more to do with that at this point. Uh, one thing I am going to do next is um, I'm going to start the file transfer so that I can install uh, 95 on there. That'll be the other thing I do. Um, yeah, since that's the other thing I do, I guess I could just make a general image and just kind of like repurpose that and reuse that. But what's the fun in that? <laughs> Why not just rebuild from scratch every time times 13? Um, but uh, yeah, I'm going to set up 95 on here as well. So G Tutar says, I think Oregon Trail goes back to mini computers in the early 70s. That's pretty cool. Um, cool little um, concept. This thing is mad. Cool little concept in that really you know, in elementary school, when, when we played the MECC games like Number Munchers, and uh, side, side note, the Macintosh librarian did a really nice uh, uh, review on that recently. Um, Oregon Trail, there's an educational component to it. You kind of have to think and plan and strategize a little bit so you can make it all the way uh, to the end. So I have a friend who lives near Willamette, Oregon, and I'd been calling it Williamette, and he... Uh, he taught me that it's Willamette, so I guess that's part of the trail, the Willamette Valley or something. So the random things that I think of. So I'm going to come in here to boot it, and I'm going to create a partition for Windows 95. I'm going to come in here. So we're going to have DOS. Actually, um, let's figure out how much space the DOS is taking. Uh, oh, let's just pop it up over here so I can see it. Um, so if we go here, you can actually go look at the free space if we go to details. So the DOS is only taking like 250 megabytes. So I think what I'm going to go ahead and do is like resize it. And then I'll go ahead and make that common partition. 
And actually, we can resize it even more once we move over Oregon Trail. But I'll go ahead and make the common partition. I'll move Oregon Trail over so that we have a little more space. So Proctor says, would you be interested in a copy of Network Boot Disk for Windows 95? Is that something different? Or is that pretty much the same thing as the, uh, as the remote setup? Network Boot Disk. Oh, is that, uh, is that something where like, we can do like a land manager sort of a thing? Um, stay tuned. <laughs> That's actually what I'm working on right now. Um, since for the thin client, I had to, um, I wanted to make an, a bootable ISO and I wanted to do FAT32 partitioning, so I ended up doing a, um, actually, the, all the procedures are out in my GitHub at this point, uh, but I needed to do a uh, um, FAT32 partition, so I actually still installed Microsoft Land Manager using a Via, Via Rhin 2, since that's what the little wise dude had in him, was a Via Rhin 2, and take that and then uh, make a Windows 95 boot disk as opposed to, say, uh, a DOS 622. And then from there, I was able to use FAT32 when I installed Windows 98. So it's actually what I was working on right before the live stream is uh, capturing the uh, procedure for that. Cool. So I'm going to, oh, wait. Um, I guess I need to make another partition to copy Oregon Trail to. We'll just make it 200 megabytes. Though actually, no, it doesn't need to be that big because our whole DOS partition is only 262. But we'll just make like, a, we'll make it, we can resize it later. That's what I love about this. And you can slide the partitions around too, which is also awesome. We'll just make this 200 megabytes. I want to leave as much space as possible for a 95. So we'll go ahead and format that puppy up. That should be sufficient. Um, and we can exit that. The video draw uses VESA or Visa video graphics, and they're not particularly great on the compacts for some reason with this program. So the redraw is really slow for boot it. So I'm going to come over to the menu items and add the common partition into the DOS arena. And let's go ahead and come over here and boot up. And then we can start copying stuff. So Jutara says, I have an old WISE terminal and I have no idea what to do with it. If it so here's what you can do. If it's a VXO like this one, you could definitely load Windows 98 on it um, with the one caveat that these come with 128 megabyte DOMs or disk on module chips. So that's kind of anemic. But I bought a 16 gigabyte, 16, yeah, 16 gigabyte one that I put in here and now I have a little more storage. Um, if it's not a wise VXO, you can go to parkytowers.me, which is a great website where uh, is it Parkinson? I can't remember the guy's name. I've chatted with him. Uh, came up with basically a way, he's basically listed a lot of the different thin clients and the hardware architectures that they have. And if yours is, you know, Intel-based or some sort of Intel-compatible, like Transmeta Caruso, yeah, that's a thing. Or this one, which has a really weird processor, like Centaur, then you can, uh, you can install Windows on it. And that would be kind of a fun thing to do. I think you should try it. Let's see here. Uh, Practice says it's sort of an auto process of installing Windows 95. Okay, so it's like a remote install. That would be a cool thing to showcase at some point. Um, I, as you can see, I'm always doing this bare metal approach, but that would be a cool thing to showcase for sure. Um, hello, Jonas or Honas. Oh, you've got a model SXO. Okay, um, that may work actually. That's cool. I think it will. Um, it's got an AMD Geo processor. It's got, let's see here, kind of looking at LSPCI. Oh, VGA controller, Realtek Ethernet, ISA. So it's got an AMD ISA. No sound. Interesting, no sound. Ah, I don't know. I wonder what people have done with it. Again, this Parky Towers website. No, people have installed Windows and DOS on it. There you go. And there's actually procedures out there. And it talks about using a pen drive, amongst other things. So you should definitely give that a shot. People have actually installed Linux on it as well. So DOS, Linux. Um, and this one's actually really well documented. They talk, like, talk about a lot of the different issues they've had doing this. So you should check it out for sure. Yeah, I, I look forward to, to doing it. If you give it a shot, um, Check, yeah, let me know. I'd be curious how it goes. And there's definitely a couple of methods. If you need to create a, a pen drive, if you check out my T5300-5700 procedure, that'll give you some insight on how to do that. And reach out if you have questions. Glad to help you out. As always, 
Let's see here. Um, and uh, Malivi says he's got a VXO. What sound driver can you use in the VXO thin client for Windows 98? Can you enable SB support in DOS mode? No. You cannot enable SB support in DOS mode, unfortunately. As far as can you, uh, what sound driver to use for 98? Funny you should ask. That's the video I'm working on today. And I just pushed the procedure. I'll drop it in the chat. Uh, if you go look at this procedure, it has a link to all the different drivers that you need. So you can go check that out, and it'll show you. It's um, Via Vinyl, and it's available on Major Geeks. The Via Vinyl V700, v, or the v, Via Vinyl version 7.00 works well. The one caveat, as I discovered earlier when I screwed up and installed Windows 98, and then went on to uh, try and install it again because I wanted to get some good footage on it, is I uh, ended up with a Windows.000 directory, and the vinyl driver was not smart enough to figure that out. <laughs> so just make sure you have a Windows directory, and you should be fine. Let's see here. Uh, S30. OK, what's that, uh, uh, Gitar, uh, the S30? Oh, is, oh, 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 OK. So you were looking at the different uh, models of the SO. Yeah, I think there was like an S30 that was associated there as well. So. Uh, uh, that's great. Yeah, I think you can do all kinds of things with that. S30 is Windows CE for web browser functionality and terminal emulation for connecting to legacy systems. Okay, so basically the different models had different amounts of flash memory, but I think pretty much had all the same and similar amounts of RAM. The S30 has 128 megabytes. You can do a lot with that. It just has a really small DOM chip of 64, so you'd want to upgrade that. And if you do that... I think I paid about $30, and I think I posted on Twitter the other day, which inspired the purge. <laughs> I, I bought this, and I bought all these thin clients in December, I was thinking, yeah, I'll make some videos on them. And uh, I was sitting at my parents' place the week before, kind of bored, and <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Anyway, I, I, so at night I was browsing and looking for some thin clients to buy, and I bought them all in December. And uh, then I, the, I misplaced the DOM, and I'm like, all right, my, wall, my, my walls are caving in. It's time to purge. And uh, last Sunday, I think I, I, I made this decision at 9 o'clock at night on a Sunday. That's always the right time to make a big decision, right? So until about 1 in the morning, I was purging stuff. Boy, did my back hurt when I was done. <laughs> anyway, so that's kind of fun. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, so Gitar says there are audio ports on the front. Yeah, uh, so what you'll want to do is you can hook in speakers or headphones, and that will work for you. There's no integrated speaker, but you can definitely hook in external sound, and that should work for you. If it's, if it's similar to my VXO, uh, that'll be the case. Uh, Ted says, holy smokes, Wi-Fi. Catch you next time I blame the owl. <laughs> totally cool. Hey, thanks for joining as always, uh, if, you didn't, if you're still here. Uh, it's great, great you're able to join. Uh, and then I missed one. Prokta says, just go, got to add uh, the drivers of the network card and you're, you're using in your way. Oh, for the uh, 95 boot? Yeah, um, that's awesome. Um, I love it when it's that simple. You can just add it and then you boot it up and you're all set. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate that. For, thanks for sending me those files. Wow, okay. Um, well, maybe I'll have some time to work on that this weekend then. Um, we'll see. Uh, I know I said I would do it in winter, but now that all the pieces are coming together... Uh, maybe that would be something to work on. I need to get my other two videos done first, and then I'll look at that. <laughs> um, let me go ahead and X copy this Oregon Trail Wind to Drive D. I'm going to get this wrong. I'm probably going to end up putting it in the root of the drive. I think if I just do that and then OT Win, I think that'll get it right. Otherwise, I'll be a directory deep. Am I the only one who, like, always, gosh, I know it's such a simple concept, but I'll go to copy files and I'll end up a directory deep when I didn't mean to. <laughs> Like, happens to me every time. I guess on Linux, I've gotten better at it because I'm copying stuff all the time, but. Hey, what happened? Did I copy that to drive? What did I do? I must have tried to copy that to drive C just now. Oh, man, I'm an idiot. Sure did. What was that command we found? Deltry. <laughs> all right, let's try again. As the old saying goes, if at first you don't succeed, maybe success is not your style. This, this machine has a super nice keyboard. Some of these, with these LTEs, some of the keyboards are really like crunchy and hard to press. This one is nice. I actually have a lot of nice uh, spare keyboards at this point. <laughs> um, 
maybe one of these days I'll go through my spare parts collection for LTEs and show people, but I think I might be embarrassed uh, given that I've got three boxes of parts. <clears throat> anyway, next topic. <laughs> Quickly, <laughs> Oregon Trail, yes, copying Oregon Trail. But yeah, eh, maybe someday we'll do it. And, um, I have a tendency to save the broken parts. Eh. And just the other day, I ordered one and it had a bad or a missing key for like the K key. And I went over to my box of parts and there I had a K key. And this machine was actually a little bit yellowed and the K key was a little bit yellowed. And yeah, it ended up uh, working out well. So it's kind of funny. Um, let's see here. Proctor says, have you ever used MS Net Server pre-LAN manager? Yes, I think so. I think I gave it a try at some point. And for whatever reason, I preferred LAN manager, so I've always kind of done that. Um, I guess at some point I could give it a shot. Um, yeah, so spoiler alert, maybe for my DOS summer video, maybe sooner. I'm going to do a, a performance test between the different methods for network transfer and DOS, because um, I know of at least four methods now. And we'll see what stacks up against one's what. LAN manager is a hog. It is such a hog when it comes to memory. If you've got LAN manager loaded, you can't do anything else. So some of the other methods we found, though, actually allow you to do more stuff. So I'm looking forward to doing that comparison. We'll do a speed. We'll do a memory footprint. Uh, printing versus non-printing. Um, some methods work better than others, I found, so there's definitely that as well. Let's see here. Julian, welcome. Glad you uh, found us here. And I'll skip down to your other one, then I'll get back to Tim's. What OS are we installing here? So we're actually copying, I just finished doing a Laplink or Fastlinks transfer from one Compaq LTE 5300 to another, and now we are installing or basically moving some things around. So. Um, that particular installation had a bunch of games, had Oregon Trail, and what I'm doing is taking Oregon Trail and moving it from one drive to another so I can make it common, because the next thing I'm going to do on this machine, now that 3.1 and DOS is installed, is install 95. So Tim says, early DOS versions where by default the path isn't shown in the prompt always caused me to create deep subdirectory trees by mistake. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's sure. Uh, prompt dollar sign P dollar sign G. Uh, it was always the command I ran on those older versions that didn't have that uh, uh, that real easy to see uh, item there. And yeah, you can end up creating directories and not knowing where you are in a hurry. Um, so yeah, uh, okay, good. Glad to know I'm not the only one. Um, I may be the only one uh, to do it, even when I have the guidance staring me in my face, unfortunately. <laughs> what can I say? Um, yeah, just certain certain concepts just never quite get cemented in the brain somehow. I, I don't know what that says about me. Next topic. <laughs> no, we can talk about that. That's fine. Uh, as far as me not cementing things in the brain, but yeah, it's some things is. Mm, I guess I'm kind of dense. I don't know. Maybe that's why I don't need Macs. <laughs> or two GSs or two Cs. Just a bunch of bunch of compacts. So, but we're we're thinning the herd out a little bit. So. Julian says I've been using Windows NT4 a lot lately. It's 95, but more advanced. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Compact Desk Pro 6000 in the basement has NT on it. Um, it's great. Um, and I boot it up occasionally. Uh, definitely more advanced. Um, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, those earlier versions of NT were kind of interesting for configuring drivers and the like. Once you understood that basically every driver is a service, it's like, oh, interesting model. But once you kind of crack that code, um, things tend to go well, as I found. But yeah, that's always kind of weird to me. It's like, I think you have a device manager, but every driver is a service. NT4 is rock solid to it. Compared to those 9x kernels that could cut out at any time, the uh, the NT kernels would certainly uh, do very well. So that was always, always, always an advantage. Um, yeah, more stable. Oh, yeah, you beat me to it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, more stable than 95 for sure. Um, uh, less blue screens of death. And uh, I always thought one of the things I really like about NT4, and I've never tried this, is since I only have Intel processors, but... Uh, Microsoft did a great job of making that cross-compatible to a multitude of processors, and not ones that we would think of either. Actually, let's go see. Um, okay, good. Hey, I got it right! Beginner's luck when it comes to that. It's in the right directory. Um, so yeah, uh, NT, NT, um, NT4 was kind of cool in that respect, and that it supported all the different processors. I, uh, I can't remember what they all were, but 
Um, you could definitely load that on lots of different machines. It's cool, it's cool to see a non-Intel-based uh, machine running Windows MT. So it's kind of neat. Um, I'm not sure what that meant. I presume that meant that you had to have, uh, yeah, you would. There was no translation layer, so you'd have to have applications that supported NT on that architecture. Uh, I don't know how common that was, but um, maybe maybe that was a thing. It was kind of interesting, though. So now I'm going to boot into um, I'm going to boot into three one here and fix that shortcut so that it points to the right place because I just nuked it. And I've moved Oregon Trail over to drive D, which we will share between the two systems here before too long. So I believe he says he had a digital PWS 600 AU with NT4 with a 600 megahertz alpha processor. Now that's got to be a rocking machine. Uh, that thing probably ran uh, NT. Oh, we don't even know. Ran NT uh, super well. So that's uh, that's exciting. Gosh, yeah, that might be an experiment I have to try. Um, wouldn't be the first time I bought something to try it out. Back when the fastest, fastest Pentium CPUs were around 200 megahertz, right? Uh, did you find that you got a lot of lift? I presume that it was fast. I mean, uh, you know how the whole megahertz war when you when you compare um, different um, different different architectures with different megahertz, how it doesn't always give you parity. Uh, but I bet it was smoking fast, wasn't it? Uh, oh, okay. So Tim says NT on the Office did have a translation layer. Oh, interesting. Okay, so you could you could literally install Word for Windows on there and it would work. Okay, now I gotta try it. <laughs> I gotta go find an alpha. <laughs> I'm sure they're not cheap. I'm, you know, whatever. That sounds like a fun thing to do. Okay, so it's an FX32. Okay, cool. So you could pretty much um, you could pretty much run any sort of a. Oh, that's that's neat. That is really cool. Wow. Yeah, that's always neat when you have have those emulation concepts that, that uh, get associated there. Yeah, so we're just updating the shortcut here because I'm OCD like that, and if I don't do it now, I'll forget. And this machine, with its nice new display, will, will be a perfect machine for tomorrow's retro gaming night. Um, it's definitely going to um, make a debut. Not a dead pixel in sight, guys. This is just, it's beautiful. Wow, so cool. Zero hours on this machine, on this screen. Okay, one hour now, but it, it's... Brand new, brand new old stock. So let's see here. Uh, Proctor says he loved Windows NT4 um, that introduced a domain and file sharing. Yes, yeah, networks were revolutionary. When we finally got to the point where we could um, share data that way, it's so much better than floppies. And I like zip drives, but so much better. I guess zip drives kind of came later anyway, but made things so much, so much easier and better. I was super excited and. Um, all of my retro PCs are networked, except, are there any that aren't? I think they all are. So even even the, uh, I've even had the PC Junior on the, net, uh, the PC Convertible on the network, as you've seen. So that's kind of fun. Um, so Jonas says, Cirox was, Cirox was certainly smoking, <laughs> yeah, uh, smoking something for sure. Um, yeah, I guess they had, they had some processors that had some good performance. Um, the Media GX was one that, um, I think based upon what they targeted it for, it wasn't really quite the right. <laughs> they didn't quite get it right as far as the audience. Um, maybe kind of a late entry as far as that that uh, cycle and software went. Um, but um, yeah, the, it, it, it's cool. Who is it? So CPU Galaxy, who started this channel, and this channel just exploded because of the interest, and it's great to see it. Um, He's covered off some of the different CPUs in that class and how some of them were much faster than others. And that's kind of cool to see uh, how fast some of those CPUs can really be. Um, and not, not the ones you'd expect either. That, that's the other thing. Not the ones you'd expect um, end up winning the competition, uh, which is always fun. Uh, and always have to root for the underdog when you come across the underdog, for sure. So I'm going to take this DOS partition. Oh, wow. 93 megabytes. So that was probably taking up a little over 100 for Oregon Trail, we can take this. Uh, let's make it 200. That'll, whoops, that'll at least give me a little bit of pad if I want to do something. But um, yeah, you go to install. So I think I think I skipped over one. Uh, Julian said he wants to install his own copy of uh, 3.1. Yeah. So uh, that's the nice thing about 3.1 is depending upon what you load up, and I don't have a whole lot loaded up, but it doesn't take up a lot of space. Um, so you can install that, and that really is probably my favorite retro operating system next to DOS. Uh, I've always been a fan for three, of 3.1, and in particular 3.1.1, as easy as it makes the networking, uh, it's really, really a lot of fun to deal with that. 
Let me read back here, make sure I didn't skip anything else. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so uh, the fans are not quite up to cooling then. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that could be a problem. Um, you know, if, uh, if we want to talk about machines that run hot, yeah, um, they're definitely machines that you put into the, the wrong form factor and uh, they tend to cook themselves to death, like, well, my Optiflex SX270, which ultimately cooked the motherboard. More on that here. That one might be next week, but my final repair video in the series of the SX270, because unfortunately the recapped motherboard did fail. Not because of the recapping, but yeah, more on that. Um, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, the machines that run hot or are not quite in the fact form factor they should be in, uh, yeah, that can be a thing. Um, Yours truly once did cook an Athlon XP processor. It did not have thermal CPU overload. I think it was an XP. <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to just power it on without the heat sink to do a quick test. Cooked it instantly. Instantly. So, yeah, it was kind of good that smarter, smarter processors <clears throat> or later processors were able to guard themselves against stupid users like me uh, that didn't do untoward things like that. So uh, it's all in the process, I guess. All right, let's re-slide that. Uh, let's see here. I remember, so Jitara says, I remember when we used to do a LAN party and we were using the old coax cable with terminators. Sometimes it would take half a day to get the network working. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But again, I, I like the concept in that you didn't have to go back to home base with every single connection. That worked particularly well in like school labs. And when ethernet was kind of starting to be a thing, that's what I was doing was setting up school labs. And it was cool that, we could just daisy chain things along the line without having to go back to the central point. One thing I don't know is what the performance of 10 base two looked like and the impact perhaps of running everything over the same cable. Um, you would, I guess electrons travel at the speed of light, but even then you'd think it hit some sort of a limitation. Um, I don't know. I don't know how 10 base two compares to a 10 base two, but yes. I remember the first time I ever set up a 10 base two network and I went out and bought a coax or a BNC cable, BNC, not coax, hooked two machines together, and I'm like, why isn't this working? What? And then I quickly learned about the need for T's and terminators. I'm like, oh, okay. Got some T's and terminators, and then I had a, uh, a 10 base 2 network, which I think was the very first network I ever set up in my house. So two machines networked via 10 base 2 and boy, was that cool. That was definitely a lot of fun. <clears throat> So Proctor says, the school network still used the coax with terminators right to the year 2000. Oh, wow. 2000. Yeah, okay. I, I guess that's that's within the realm, though. Uh, but yeah, definitely at that point, it was starting to get a little bit long in the tooth. Um, I, I I don't know the max. I'm curious. I'm going to look it up. So what is the max transfer speed for 10 base 2 um, as compared to Ethernet? Um, I, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. I'm really curious. Oh, it's 10 megabytes. 10 megabits. Okay. So it was the same as kind of the same as like your early RJ45. That's impressive, actually. So then the next question becomes, and I'll call it the DSL versus cable argument, is <laughs> are you sharing that 10 megabytes with everybody on your same line, or is it going to be a case where it's you know kind of more leveled out? Yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. As I ask myself questions. So uh, Proctor says Windows 3.1 and Windows 3.1.1 run for fun. I should have a play with uh, Windows 3.1 for work groups. Yes, you should. Uh, it's great. It's real easy to configure a network. Jataris, 10 base 2 is Ethernet. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. Um, I just wasn't sure if maybe it had a different speed limitation uh, versus the 10 base uh, T, for example, or AUI or the different Ethernet formats. But yeah, um, so I was kind of surprised that it was. 10 megabytes over the medium, but I guess that kind of makes sense. It's, to, to your point, it's using the same protocols and the like, just a different uh, hardware interface, so good call. Um, I didn't really think about that. It's a really good point. All right, I'm going to resize this here, and then I might just give it a call here, um, but yeah, we'll get this puppy resized. 154 megabytes, let's go 175, and now we've I don't think I've ever aggressively claimed this much memory for my 95 installation. So <laughs> usually I'll try and claim a little bit, but this uh, this claims a lot. Um, that's cool. It's complete. So now what I can do is create a Windows 95 partition, 
And since it's only a 900 megabyte drive, I'm just gonna do uh, FAT16, and there's a very good reason for that. I can then use uh, networking and MS-DOS or Win311 to copy over the installer for 95 without having to use fast links or something else. And that's typically how I do this. Uh, for the 13 plus machines that I've set up, I've done it all the same. <laughs> I guess consistency is a virtue or boring, but that's how I've been setting these puppies up. So, so Proctor says the link uh, shows you something free ethernet Znet. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I haven't looked much into Znet. Um, yeah, it, it, there were definitely a variety of different protocols, and it's not always the best one that wins. Uh, for example, TCP/IP is a terrible protocol, uh, <laughs> but it was the one that was most ubiquitous, and as they call it, network effect. Literally, I mean, in this case, but same was true for VHS versus VHS versus Beta. Beta was the better format, but there were more VHS tapes out there, so guess what won? So it's all relative, but uh, that's kind of how that works, I guess. Cool, so this is uh, booting up into 3.1. I'm going to copy the 95 stuff over, and then I'll start a 95 install, and I'll just let it run. Um, let's go to 3.1. See if we get our conflicts again. That was weird. Um, maybe the router at this point has dropped that metadata um, or those records so uh, we'll see what ends up happening here hopefully hopefully <laughs> if not i'll just go grab another one of my 10 cars <laughs> that hasn't been powered on in a while and uh, we should be good there for sure yeah very interesting so yeah very good all right, so this is about booted up here, and then I'll copy over the 95. Still just loving this screen. It's, uh, for those who joined late, I can disconnect the fastening cable. That's what we did. We put a new screen on this guy, and really the camera doesn't do it justice because it just it looks wonderful. New old stock. Uh, doesn't smell new old stock like the box did, so that's, that's, a, that's, a, po that's a positive thing because that's stunk. <laughs> but, yeah, um, definitely the case. I was going to pop open file manager here and uh, hopefully, so we've got a drive E now, which is going to be our 195 drive. If I pop over to drive Z, which is the um, uh, retro Pi, or the, um, which I'm going to call it, Raspberry Pi, we should have a Win9525 directory and I can just drag that over here and it'll copy over the network and once it finishes that I can install it. So, um, Procta asks, what do you think of Active Directory? I can't say I've stood up an installation. You know, I'm, I'm sure I've used things that use Active Directory. Um, was it Dave's Garage who recently did a video on act, when Active Directory came to be? Um, wow, revolutionary concept, that's for sure. Um, before that, people were passing lists of email addresses on a daily basis. When, the direct, when you had Active Directory, you could actually just go look it up. So that was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, I uh, I haven't done much with it. Um, yeah, some of the yeah, uh, it's kind of interesting the things I configure or or, or, or do walkthroughs for versus don't. <laughs> that would be an interesting one to do though. Um, hadn't been on my radar, but uh, yeah, Active Directory's definitely a cool concept. Um, yeah, yeah, that would be that would be a fun thing to set up at some point. Yeah. Well, we can see this copying over. Uh, hopefully it behaves itself. When I was copying things to the thin client earlier today from another from another Raspberry Pi, uh, it took three tries without network timeouts, which is kind of odd. But then again, that particular Raspberry Pi was running uh, on a um, uh, wireless network. So, did Microsoft lift the idea from Novell NDS? Probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, how do we put this nicely? It wouldn't be the first thing that Microsoft copied. <laughs> then again, uh, Apple, which got really angry at Microsoft for making Windows 3.1, uh, copied Xerox. So you know, it's all about not copying too much, just copying enough so that you can bring your product to market. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, I presume that was the case. Uh, yeah, poor old Novell. Novell just <clears throat> didn't quite make it. Uh, neither did Lantastic. Um, I feel that 90, Windows 95 really killed Lantastic. Um, maybe even Windows 4 groups started to really kill Lantastic. Um, and Novell, 
Yeah, I guess Microsoft networking kind of killed it as well. Since once again, if you get something out of the box and it's available, then you know, why, why go pay for something? You know, you can just you can just use something. So, and there's definitely something to be said for that. So, very cool. Well, guys, we're coming up on uh, two hours here, almost to the second. Um, I'm looking at my mic batteries for the uh, for the road mics, and they're getting kind of low. <laughs> Um, oh, weird. Aaron, we've hit an error. So I'm going to have to go figure out what's going on with that. Uh, but um, yeah, this has certainly been a lot of fun. Uh, let's look at a couple of uh, a couple more questions here, and then probably we'll, we'll give things a wrap. But uh, so Vandalay Industries, that's a great, <laughs> that's a great username. Uh, we should do something Hollywood versus reality video of some 90s movies that have a lot of tech in them, like Jurassic Park and The Net. Yeah. I t I, I'm going to write that down because um, that's what I do with my video ideas. Plus, if I don't write it down, I'll forget. So um, I'm going to make, make a quick note of that. Uh, come on, notepad, load up. Um, I like that. Namely because, I don't know about you guys, but when I watch those old movies, <laughs> like Jurassic Park, um, I always kind of like to look at the tech and kind of and, and, and might have been more interested in that than the subplot. <laughs> What can I say? Born a geek, not raised a geek. I kind of self. Nobody in my family was really into this sort of stuff. I'm the only software engineer, team lead, whatever in my family. Um, everybody else does some other things. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, that's that's what I enjoyed about the movies. That would be a fun thing to do. So, um, let's see here. So Jatara says, um, I don't think IPX SPX would have scale. Like TCP/IP, ah, yeah, that's that's a true statement. Um, yeah, it was kind of a, yeah, it, you, you would probably hit a limit for sure. Uh, granted, with TCP/IP, we've hit a limit with IPv4, um, so there's definitely uh, something to be said for that. Well, I guess we haven't hit it yet, but it's something that we'll hit. So, so Tim says that Novell stole NDS from Banyan Vine Street Talk. <laughs> yeah, so the chain continues. Uh, Somebody stole it from somebody, stole it from somebody. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's that's interesting. Why is this having a file access error? That's just weird. I'm going to try it again. If not, I'm going to have to kick over to the Raspberry Pi and, uh, and figure out what's going on. I don't think I have a Telnet client. Otherwise, I could hit over from this PC. Uh, but I do have, um, yeah, I do have um, a uh, SSH client on there. So anyway. Very good. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get that going. Um, I also see now that I am getting a notification that YouTube is having some sort of a problem with buffering. Uh, so we'll probably just go ahead and end this here. Uh, maybe somebody has jumped on another PC in the house, or maybe my Windows 95 file copy here has gone completely rogue and is eating all the bandwidth. But uh, hey, listen, it's been great. Thanks everybody who joined. Hope you enjoyed uh, the video in the live stream, and thanks for everybody for participating. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and there it goes again, some sort of problem um, that I'll, I'll have to go figure that out. But um, yeah, it's been great uh, chatting with everybody. I, I love doing this. I uh, thought, you know, once again, Compact LT videos, I was doing a lot of them, so I thought, well, I'll just, anytime I'm going to do any sort of work on an LT, I'm just going to do a live stream. So that's, that was kind of the idea of the day, why we did the live stream. Uh, but yeah, screen looks great. We're going to get this all set up, and then from there, uh, we'll see what we do with it. Um, definitely use it for the retro gaming night tomorrow, and then we'll see where it goes from here. But this is this is exciting to have this this screen here. So, just final readouts here. Um, yeah, uh, Procta definitely uh, give Novella a, a spin. Um, I've got some tutorials that I've done on it, and uh, looking forward to talking about net setup. And the boot disk, yeah, that's those will be two fun topics. Uh, I need to add that to my list of things as well. Um, a remote stall, remote install of 95. I don't do it, but I think others would find it interesting. So we'll uh, we'll definitely do that. I need to go back through the comments here. I'm just going to grab them all and put them on the clipboard so that because there were some other folks that had some good ideas for videos, and I'm not sure these are going to play back. So I'm going to grab them all and put them, and I'll review them, and uh, we'll pull out some other ideas. Uh, yeah, I love it. I mean. That's what this is all about. Um, what I love to do here is um, make things that I'm interested in and also what other people are interested in. So 
thank you for sharing uh, the ideas. Uh, definitely, we'll do that. And if you don't want me to steal one of them because you're planning to do a video on it, let me know. <laughs> but otherwise, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll we'll proceed with some of these. So, cool. All right, well, off to figure out where why this is so ticked off here and off to charge the road mics uh, for uh, other endeavors that will be happening this weekend. Thanks again. R really appreciate everybody. Wow, this is so much fun. This is what I love the most about doing this is being able to interact with folks. So thanks for joining. And hey, have a great uh, Friday night. And uh, wherever you are, uh, it's later in some parts of the world than others, but I hope that you have a great weekend. And uh, Oh, new video coming out this weekend. Uh, I can't remember what it is, but there's definitely something coming out. Might be the Optiflex SX270 video, so you can look for that. I'll probably release it tomorrow or Sunday, so it'll be on its way. So, cool. Let me just do one final check of the chat since I copied all the comments, and now it's not showing me the latest. And uh, we'll make sure we've got everything all addressed here, and we'll call it a night. So, okay, uh, Windows Whistler build. That's a good one as well. Um, yeah, that's been done in a couple of cases, but I will grab that as well. So we'll definitely have a look at that as well. So very good. Well, guys, all right, uh, thanks again. Uh, hope you enjoyed, and uh, I'll see you later. Reach out if I can do anything for you. Talk to you soon. Bye now.